In this section, we will concentrate on battery technology. Batteries are just a method of storing electrical energy, and here we'll have a brief look at their history, their chemistry, and how our IoT requirements are satisfied by the design options available today. On the way, we will consider Babylon, Leaping Monks, and Bombs. A common model often used to explain batteries is water, as it maps battery technology and terminology back into our everyday experience. We are well aware that banging a nail into a large tank of water could cause a current of water to flow. The size of this current would depend upon the size of the hole. The larger the hole, the more water would flow, as the larger the hole, the less resistance to the flow there would be. Let's just stick a tap and a pipe into our model, and we would realise that a normal domestic tap would suffice to control the flow from a small tank, whereas we may need to use a fire hydrant, or perhaps something a little larger, were the tank to be, say, a dam. We know that the larger the head of water above the tap, the higher the pressure would be, and the greater the current for a given hole diameter. The head of water is forced through the hole by gravity. The higher the water, the greater the potential energy. In electronics, potential energy is measured in terms of volts, the current flow in amps, and the size of the resistance in ohms. So, the flow is equal to the potential divided by the resistance. I equals V over R, or rearranged, V equals I times R, which is known as Ohm's law. Another obvious insight this model brings is that the tank or dam only contains a finite amount of water. Let's call this quantity Q. Given sufficient time, the water will leak away, providing another equation, where the total quantity Q is the current times the time. Q equals I times T. Given that we appear to be on a roll here with this maths thing, let's try one more. After all, it's only multiplication and division. A common use of a dam is for the generation of electricity, power. Fitting a generator onto our pipe, we would realise that the power we could generate would increase as the current increases and increase as the voltage increases. Power would therefore be the size of the current multiplied by the size of the voltage. Power in watts equals current in amps times the voltage in volts. We could do a substitution of V equals IR into the equation to give P equals I squared R, or I equals V over R to give P equals V squared over R to give another set of equations that are useful when examiners run out of ideas when setting papers. Let's just stop while we're ahead. Did you notice the units in the equations above? Ohms for resistance, amps for current, watts for power, Q in coulombs, and volts for voltage. These are not just random words, but units commending scientists whose work we rely on today. Ohms, the German George Seaman Ohm, and the Frenchman André Marie Ampère, Watts, James Watt, the Scotsman, and Volts, Alessandro Volta, the Italian inventor of the battery. It was Volta who noticed the electrical potential when zinc and copper plates were separated by an electrolyte. He continued to add a series of basic cells into what became known as a pile. The pile produced what he described as an electromotive force, or voltage, as we would now call it. When news of his work was published, it started a flurry of developments that led directly to battery cells we use today. But this work could have almost started 2,000 years before. In 1936, evidence of this clay device with dissimilar metals that was thought to hold vinegar was discovered near Baghdad. It is a battery cell. Voltage source. Drawn schematically, this is a voltage source. It will supply an electromotive force of voltage that will drive a current through a resistance, observing Ohm's law, V equals IR. We can start with an open circuit and add a variable resistor. As the resistance decreases, the current increases. And going back to our water analogy, we have here in the variable resistor the equivalent of our domestic tap. We've already discussed the equation for power dissipated in the resistor and all of its variants. In practice, small variable resistors look like this, and ones capable of handling much larger power look like this and this. The resistor here can be termed a load. A light load takes a small current, and a heavy load drains a lot of current. Here is an example of a reasonably heavy load current. We can see from these two images that one is unlikely to work. With current technology, <laughs> No pun intended. It's unlikely that the option on the right is likely to function. There are a number of reasons for this that we need to investigate. Q stood for quantity in our water model. It's understood how water pouring from a small container would differ from that from a large container or dam. So the current being drained from a battery could be due to the load 
or just the exhaustion of the battery supply. Of course, as batteries improve, they will be able to store more and more charge in a smaller and smaller volume, and become lighter in the process. We will consider this in more detail shortly. A perfect battery will provide a constant voltage forever, at any temperature, whatever the load. In fact, this perfect source is able to do the impossible, holding the same voltage regardless, even when its terminals have been short-circuited, in which case it's delivering an infinite current. This model, of course, has to be modified to represent real-world batteries. In practice, the internal structure of any battery has some kind of resistance, and this may be modelled thus. Our int is the internal resistance, and it has the following effect. As the load increases, i.e. the resistance falls, the current increases. When the external load is equal to R int, the output of the battery, as seen at the terminals, it will have fallen to half V source, as the equation for this circuit is... A low internal resistance is therefore a sign of a good battery. Consider, if the internal resistance heats up more and more as current passes, causing its resistance to fall and further current to pass, then you have a condition called thermal runaway that may cause the battery to explode. Time and temperature also play an effect in the manner in which the battery discharges. The voltage will not just stop when a battery is discharged, it will vary with time, load, temperature, and even, to a certain extent, as to whether the load has been continuous or switched on and off. This graph is typical of the variation of the output of the battery as it discharges. They are rarely constant. Batteries may be added in series to increase the available voltage, as with the original voltaic pile, or be connected in parallel to increase the available quantity, where the voltage remains the same, but the overall quantity of charge is increased. One method of constraining the variation of the output of the battery is to use a regulator. The requirement for the regulator is that it can control the power available from the battery. It receives the voltage across the range of values supplied by the battery, V in, and stabilises this to V out, suitable for the device. A design will usually involve adding sufficient cells in series to achieve the operating voltage required, and connecting this into the regulator. Two important parameters in judging a regulator are a. The overall power that it can handle, essentially the voltage and current being controlled, and b. The efficiency of the device. Battery charge is at a premium, and the regulator should consume the absolute minimum power as it operates. A low power consumption is usually achieved when V drop, the difference between V in and V out, is low. Having a large supply that needs to be dropped by many volts is usual in high power circuits, but is rarely acceptable in IoT designs where charge is at a premium. Matching the battery supply to the load presented by the device is important. In some circumstances, a convenient battery or combination of battery is not possible, and the operating voltage of the device is higher than the battery. In this instance, a booster may be employed. In this way, a single 3.7 volt lithium ion battery can power a 5 volt circuit. When using a regulator or booster circuit, it is possible to also include some form of short circuit protection to protect the battery from any faults in the device. Let's now look at the different types of battery and how they compare for use in low power IoT projects. Real batteries come in many familiar forms and latterly flat foil formats. There are two basic types, primary and secondary. Primary cells are disposable that can only be used once. Secondary cells may be recharged for reuse. As a side point, we have an example of a huge secondary cell here at Dunorwig in North Wales, UK. Water from an upper lake is released into the lower lake as power is required. Generation can be turned on very rapidly, and of course the site is environmentally friendly. The water is then pumped up for reuse during off-peak periods. Meanwhile, Back on track. Pink bunnies are familiar icons connected with the alkaline battery. They have been outpacing the familiar old zinc carbon battery for some while now, although the full long life and capacity that they claim is only gained when they are used under a constant load. Switching them on and off reduces their total capacity, but their performance is still good. Over 10 billion alkaline batteries have been manufactured worldwide. Sales of the traditional carbon zinc battery still remain at about 20% of the UK market because of their apparent low cost. They have been the basic standard for many decades, although they are prone to corrode internally, causing the case to rupture and leak. 
both carbon zinc and alkaline batteries come in a wide range of standard sizes and are composed of cells that maintain about 1.5 volts. Secondary batteries. Nickel cadmium may seem to be new, but were invented in 1899. They've helped pave the way for modern technology, but they are being used less and less because of cadmium's toxicity. Nickel cadmium batteries lost 80% of their market share in the 1990s to batteries that are more familiar to us today, such as the nickel metal hydride that appeared in 1989. The nickel metal hydride formulation uses a hydrogen absorbing alloy instead of toxic cadmium. This makes it more environmentally safe and it also helps to increase the energy density. Nickel metal hydride batteries are used in power tools, digital cameras and many other forms of electronic devices. They are also used in early hybrid vehicles such as the Toyota Prius. They are available in standard sizes and are relatively cheap. They are easier to charge than lithium batteries, but have the drawback that they will self-discharge when left unattended. It can provide more peak power than the equivalent alkaline battery, but operates at a lower cell voltage of 1.2 to 1.4 volts. Lithium batteries are at the heart of the modern day world, powering everything from mobile phones and tablets to power tools and cars. They were first introduced into widespread use by Sony in 1991. Lithium iron and lithium polymer may be grouped together when considering the charging discharging performance. The main difference being that lithium iron batteries tend to appear in standard battery sizes and lithium polymer lipos have a polymer internal construction that allows them to be manufactured in a more flexible and flatter form. They are the most powerful commonly available batteries available to date with an amazing ability to deliver current. They have the highest energy density performance. You can see on this chart how batteries have developed when considered as a physical concentration of power. As time progresses, more instantaneous power can be yielded from a smaller volume. Extended this rapid transformation of energy, you will soon realise that your battery becomes a bomb. Already there have been some high profile battery failures. In particular, the grounding of the Boeing Dreamliner, when faults with their battery performance caused fires. Most postal services also refuse to carry these batteries. Individual lithium cells can also vary widely in performance. This has an impact, particularly when charging. Each cell has to be individually balanced to achieve safe and consistent performance. For completeness, we will add the granddaddy of the original secondary cell, the lead acid battery. They've been around since 1859. They are familiar, heavy, relatively cheap, but easy to charge. Although they do not have a particularly high energy volume, they can deliver very high surge currents, which has made them the default battery for use in cars. Gas emissions during charging can make them susceptible to ignition, but latterly, improved sealed versions remove this problem and ensure that they will not leak corrosive chemicals. One last section in this chart is a storage device that is technically not a battery, but can deliver a significant amount of charge, as was demonstrated in 1745 when a line of monks were all seen to hop simultaneously when they were electrocuted by the charge stored in a Leyden jar. Today, this jar has been developed into the super and now ultra capacitor. They have been developed to hold significant amounts of power. The main advantage of super and ultra capacitors is their very rapid charge and discharge rates. Circuits. This is a block diagram of a complete charging circuit for a typical secondary cell. The control circuit is connected to, say, a 3.7 volt LiPo battery. This is charged via a USB device and has a booster to provide the 5 volts required by the remainder of the device. The control device has to regulate the input voltage and ensure that the battery is protected from over voltage, overcharge, and short circuit. Some batteries have heat sensitive resistors called thermistors included in their construction to warn against high temperatures. The booster section will attempt to maintain a stable operating power, voltage and current, and also protect the battery from short circuits on the output. Another use of a circuit such as this would be when the source was a solar panel, hydro or wind generator, when the input conditions could be far more erratic. Power from the solar panels requires special consideration and is beyond the scope of this video. These requirements are, however, so common that a dedicated device is available. Resistors are used to establish the required voltage and current limits. Of all of the international units discussed above, one is rarely quoted on batteries, and this is the total charge. 
Small rechargeable batteries will be often labelled as here, with a voltage and a capacity Q normally with the unit MAH, where MAH means milliamp hours. It's not possible to ascertain whether this is an aid to technicians or the marketing boy's attraction to the use of large numbers. An example is 1800 milliamp hours. It implies that when the battery is fully charged, it can continuously supply 1800 milliamps for an hour. It also means it could supply 900 milliamps for two hours or 3600 milliamps for 30 minutes. The performance may be characterized by this across reasonable limits. The figure is helpful when considering the useful life of a time of a supply. All LoRaWAN things operate in what is known as Class A mode. Class A behavior consists of four separate phases of operation. These have been described elsewhere in this course as A, deep sleep mode, B, active mode, C, send mode, and D, active receive mode. To maintain battery life, the operational device spends a majority of its time in A, a deep sleep mode, consuming just sufficient power to run the internal timer or the circuits needed to be sensitive to an external stimulus that will cause an interrupt. A point to note here is the overall efficiency of the supply and the current consumed by the regulator and that of the attached sleeping device. Either way, the device is caused to wake up into B, the active mode, which causes an increase in the current consumption. Step C, send mode, is where the most power is normally required, as the transmitter operates, before falling back into the receive mode, D, where the device is listening for any reply returned by the gateway. If data is received, it will process and act as required by the internal programming, before falling back into the original deep sleep. Quantity of charge used during each phase is the area below the line. Let's place some figures on the chart. The important value is the total charge used, Q equals IT, and care should be exercised with the units. Tabulating the four states we have. With a typical smart battery phone being quoted as, say, 2000 milliamp hours, our device here will last for Q equals IT. T equals 2000 milliamp hours divided by 40 microamps results in 5.7 years. If the device were to transmit continuously and illegally, the time taken to exhaust the battery would be 40 hours. This displays how extreme the lifetime values can be, but they are quoted to make another point. Consider a device operating within the legal extremes of SF7 and SF12. The difference is that the short 11 byte data packet takes 60 milliseconds at SF7 and 1.8 seconds in SF12, over 30 times as much. Assume that the device wakes every 15 minutes. B is 180 milliseconds. The receive phase takes 2,100 milliseconds. And again, by the magic of maths by crossfade, we end up with... Conclusion. We may have shown here that batteries turn out to have more character than may have been expected. Batteries play an increasingly important role in our daily lives, with the prevalence of mobile devices or the move back towards electric traction. We have shown those that decay, those that have been legislated against, those that just drain away on their own, and those that just explode. Even operational batteries can develop memories that can constrain their original performance to just 50% of their original capacity after a few hundred charging cycles, or worse if the battery has been mistreated. There is promise that some future designs could increase in capacity the more that they are used. Batteries are getting lighter and holding more charge in a reduced volume. They will charge and discharge ever more rapidly. Taken to an extreme, this means that the correct title for a battery is a bomb. So do take care.